All right, let's get ready to dig in our Bibles this morning. So would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2. Yeah, I mean, God's been laying it on my heart. You know, we finished camp meeting, and at camp meeting each morning, Mike and I took a church health class. Um, it's called NCD Training, National Church Development. And I'm already trained in National Church Development. Um, what Mike didn't know, and you could ask him, is Mike had assumed that church planting, that, I, that Rami and I are just going at it without like a roadmap, that we're just kind of figuring out to go along. And what Mike learned at camp is that actually, no, I'm trained in NCD, and there's actually a roadmap that we follow. There's some, there's some goals and some things that we want to see the church achieve each year if we know the church is actually going to be around for years to come. So Mike was pretty surprised to learn those things. It got him all excited because he's like, oh, there's a reason why you're doing some of that stuff that you do, that, like small groups and things like that. So I'm going to share a little bit about this morning. But it really got me thinking that, you know, we talked about, we took the survey, and more than 15 different people took the survey, and we got the results in. And every single one of them said that one you would recommend New Beginnings to a friend. Nobody said they wouldn't, so I was pretty happy about that because you never know. The other one is across the board, everybody said that there wasn't anything they would change. They would tweak a few things, but nobody asked for a major change in anything. They, they suggested kids ministry and small groups, little tweaks that we could do. So we're definitely, gonna, we're definitely doing some tweaking. As you know, we've made a switch between Andrew and Katie teaching in middle school. Katie's down there killing it each week. The kids are loving it because she brings a lot of fun energy to that group. And Katie tells me that by this time next year, she's going to fill that whole side of the sanctuary at middle schoolers. So I'm like, you go, girl. I'm right there with you. I'm all about that. Amen. But, you know, we, we recently started thinking about, you know, what makes New Beginnings special? We're sitting here as New Beginnings Church of God on 16th and Poplar Street here in Canova. We're smack dab in the middle of three churches that are a lot bigger than we are and been around 100 years longer than we've been around and offer lots of programming and things that we don't have because they got the budgets and all that kind of stuff. So, so what is it that makes us unique? What is it that we can offer our community? What, what, makes, what makes the Church of God different? the things that we could celebrate. And, you know, it seems like we're coming out of the pandemic and so on. And while we're at camp meeting, we heard that West Virginia Ministries of the Church of God, there used to be like 121 Church of God congregations in the state. And now it's down to like 66. There's only 66 Church of Gods left. I mean, they're, they're all just dying off. And out of that 66, um, there's 10 or more that are getting ready to close in the next year or so. And this is, not, this is not just the Church of God. This is every denomination, every movement is seen as the same kind of thing. Like the pandemic is, has really caused a toll on churches, and, and churches didn't survive, and yet here we are thriving. Praise God. You've got a hand this morning. Because let me tell you something. The pandemic had everything in it to kill this church, to kill us. Financially, everything else. And yet, because you guys all stayed faithful, continued, even when we were closed, you were still tithing and doing the things that you should have done. We, we made it through. That's not the same for everybody else. There's, there's numerous churches around us that are struggling. In, in West Virginia, there, there's less than 20 churches that are thriving. And I'm thankful that New Beginnings is counted among those 20 that we're thriving. We have lots of potential, lots of hope, and lots of places to go. But it asks ourselves, you know, what's different? You know, this summer we tried small groups, and we split small groups up by age just to see what would happen, and we just made it easy. I got a lot of pushback about that. <laughs> Some older people want to be young people, young people want to be older people, and across the board, and like that. And, it was, it was, and I got reminded, mind you, that I said early on that my goal for small groups was to set them up on different blocks in our community, so we're reaching our community. And I had to remind people, like, I'm just, we're just testing the waters this summer. We're, we're getting there. But, so I do want to say that across the board, small groups are hit or miss this summer. Some of them, ours that meet the second Mondays met regularly, which is awesome. Um, the young adults and older adults hit or miss back and forth. And a few people said, we don't like the age thing. We just want to go to the one that we feel like led to go to. And that is ultimately the goal. So I'm going to talk about that this morning. So I do want to acknowledge that I, I, that I acknowledge those struggles in the groups. And I acknowledge that getting them off the ground and, and trying to pair people up is a challenge. Because there, there's some people you just don't gel. You know, and you just don't gel for whatever reason it is. And we, we for, you know, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But so, but I want to tell you this morning why they're important, too. Why the next step for New Beginnings has a lot to do with what we do with small groups. 
and how we reach our community. So, but you know, we think about this whole thing that we call church, and and you know, it's not that we're just we're trying to reinvent the wheel or, or do something that hasn't been done before. I praise the Lord Jesus Christ that His church is laid out in Scripture, and He kind of gives us a roadmap. Jesus kind of says, "Here are some things that a good church needs to have in order to be a church." And if you don't have these things, you need to ask yourself, why don't you have these things? But there is some things that should mark us as a church. And, and one of those things you said, you don't know my, you'll know they're my disciples by their love. Anybody in here would call this a loving church? Raise your hand. Across the board, everybody says that. Amen. But here's the deal. Our love has to cross the borders of just loving ourselves here to loving ourselves out there. That, that we have relationships outside these four walls that we're actually doing life together, that we're spending time together, we're, we're spiritually pouring into each other, we're, we're breaking bread and sharing meals, and, and we're doing things that, that Christians should be doing. Because it's, it's one thing to say, oh, we're a loving group of people when you come in the door, but that love has to go outside the door. And I think for us, that's the next step, to say, how can we take that loving relationships we have in here and get them outside the door? So that when we're out in the community, we're actually spending time together and having meat and so on. So read with me in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 42 to 47. Now this is the early church. This is right after Pentecost. Jesus died on the cross. The Holy Spirit comes and the church is just getting started. Acts chapter 2, Peter gets the incredible job of preaching the first gospel message. He stands up in front of thousands of people who didn't know Jesus, didn't know what to do. They just, they just knew that this Jesus resurrected from the dead and it meant something. So Jesus gets up and tells them, he's gets, you guys are all sinners. You're all going to hell. You're all guilty of killing Jesus. Now you need to do something about it. And it says those people got cut to the heart. They're like, wait, we don't, we don't want that to be on our shoulders, right? So he goes and he preaches the message. And, and about 3,000 people we see in a chapter accepted Jesus that day. It's incredible. So we get to verse 42, and now the church is starting to live it out. These are the early days of the church. This is what the disciples did that made the Lord add to their number daily. So listen to this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." I want you to know that, 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 that there is something so incredible that happens when, 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 when disciples of Jesus love each other enough that they start doing life together. People notice. When, when, there, when there's Christians that are actually hanging out together and, and they're sharing scripture, they're praying for each other, they're having meals together, they're, they're worshiping together, they go to church and after church they go do something else. And, and, and it says, you know, some of us, man, we really struggle with this because I'm like, I can't even get half the people who would call this place their home church to come to church. Hallelujah. Half the people who say New Beginnings Church of God is their home church are not here this morning. Home, and you know what? What the problem is, is like, if I started saying we're going to meet every single day, I'd have a protest probably on my hands, right? I'd be, there'd be people picketing out there. That evil pastor wants to meet every single day. How dare he? It's one week, once a week for an hour. And I know it's for different reasons. I'm not picking on everybody because when you're sick and you, you're having kids and you got all that going on, that, there's lots of reasons not to be at church, and those are good reasons not to be. But for a lot of people, they don't really have a good reason. <laughs> so, Caitlin, I'm not picking on you this morning. I, when I saw you walk in this morning, I'm like, thank God we're praying because tomorrow's a big day. Tomorrow we welcome Jovi into the world, so praise God. So, sister, that message right there was not about you. you you're good. I don't want you to get upset with me back there. <laughs> but there's a lot of people who should be here that just not here. They're home laying in bed. They're sitting on the couch, and, and they're missing this. They would say, oh, we, we love the church. And I'm going to say, do you really? You really? Because <laughs> what if we, what if, what if this was, what if we met together daily? What if every night of the week I had dinner with a different, different person in the church? Oh. <laughs> Jesus, you can't have my schedule. <laughs> that would tear up a lot of schedules, wouldn't it? Each night of the week I'm saying, you know what, each day, lunch, dinner, something, I'm going to meet with another Christian and have a meal with them. 
And you know what? I'm going to go to the church every single day to pray. If I left these doors open all day and said, just come in and pray during the day, how many of you would actually come to church every single day to pray? Very few would do it. Right? Some of you would, and Jennifer walked on the block for sure. And maybe Earl would come in, hang out in the office a little bit, but <laughs> not many, would you? So God's plans for the church is still the best plan. I'm going to tell you that this morning. God's plan for the church is still the best plan. And God had a plan in the beginning, and the early disciples got it right. And we have an opportunity here to get it right. Because seriously, though, the church has the right message. The church has the right message. And what did they preach? What they preach? They preach that Jesus died on the cross because of your sins, and your sins put him there, so now you got to do something about it. They went into their community, looked at the world around them, and said, the reason why the world is so messed up, the reason why there's addiction and problems and broken families and broken marriage, and the reason why things are messed up is because there's this, this evil thing called sin. And they went on and said, but guess what? You don't have to stay stuck in that because Jesus died on the cross for you. He loves you. And if you accept him, something good's going to happen. So they had the right message. We look at our community, and then there's lost people every house, every other house. There's block after block after block. 70, 80% of this community is unchurched and not in church anymore, and they don't really know Jesus. And it's gotten to the point that there's second and third generation. There's little kids coming into church without their parents because their parents and grandparents don't know Jesus. And what do we tell them? Jesus loves you and he died for you. See, what makes us unique is we got the right message. You know, I could get up here like some of these prosperity preachers and all that and, and skip preaching Jesus. I mean, if you go on the religious TV, you could watch whole sermons by these famous guys with planes and jets and all this stuff. They never even tell you the name of Jesus. But you know what? Give me 1995 and you'll get a blessing. Bring me in that $99.95 right now this morning. You give me $100, you get a blessing, right? Imagine I preach that nonsense. People listen to it. There's churches around here to teach you that you got to jump through hoops to get saved. You got to be the right person. You got to dress the right way. You got to have the right bank account. You got to have the right look. You got to have the right attitude. You got to have all this kind of stuff. And no, it doesn't. the church of God says, no, everybody's welcome here because Jesus Christ died for everybody. This is an open church for everybody, not just the people that are here. We want to be an open church for everybody who lives on this block and that block and the next block and on Tom's block and, and your block and your block and your block and out around 75 in Spring Valley in Ohio. Love you. I mean, we, we want to be a church for every block. That's what we preach. And we preach about God's sovereignty. We preach that there is a God. No matter how much the world says God might be dead, no, he's not dead. He's a very living and active God. Anybody have an experience with God in this church? I'm asking for hands this morning. I'm not guessing. Who in the church have had an experience with God? Most of you guys, yeah. Amen, amen. Some of you. I'm going to get to you in a second. <laughs> You know what happened on Wednesday night was the most incredible thing. In the Church of God, Anderson, as we call it ourselves, we're a non-denominational church. We don't tell that non-denominational nonsense that a lot of churches do. Yet we're we're Wesleyan and we're holiness in our in our history, in our nature. It's our it's who we come from. So what that means is is we believe in some things. We believe that in faith alone, in Christ alone. That Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, died on the cross, and through him there's life, forgiveness, redemption. We also believe in holy living, this idea of holy living, that through the power of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and through the Holy Spirit that's been poured on us, you can actually live a holy life. And what a holy life means is every single day, you're just trying to be more like Jesus. That you can actually, I don't, you can actually be like Jesus. You can you could talk like him and walk like him and love like him and live like him and you could love the father as much as he loved the father and, and yeah you, you you might not get perfect until the day you cross over but you can get pretty close if you want to because it's offered to you and we we believe in this thing and we believe in grace amen we believe in grace we believe that all each of us are on a different journey and we're growing up on a different path and there's this thing that we've talked about wednesday night called the second work of grace that's at a point where you're a christian some of you guys have been christian now for years but there comes a point in your life where you're like, God, I don't want to sin anymore. I, I, don't want, I don't want this struggle in my life. I don't want it, whatever it is. And at that moment in your Christian walk, you go to Jesus and you pray and say, God, I need you to remove this from me because I really do want to be holy. 
I really, God, if you say I can have it, if you say be holy, then God, I want to be holy. So God, you need to do a work in my heart. You, you need to do some surgery. I mean, you need to do something to remove whatever it is. And Wednesday night, we had two brothers go to the altar and say, you know what? That's what we want. We, we've been a Christian for a while, but we're struggling with our language and our attitude and whatever it is. We don't want to do that anymore. And I just got to thinking to myself, like, like, we believe that holy living is possible because it's biblical. Amen. And yet, God, we don't talk about that second work enough. How many Sundays should we come in and hit the altar and say, man, God, I need you to remove some stuff from my life. I, I've picked up some baggage over the years. You know, my mouth is out of control, my language is out of control, my attitude, wh- whatever it is. Smoking, addiction, drinking, I don't know, whatever it is. And God said, you know what, I don't want to be doing this as a Christian. So God, I need you to take this from me. Because God, I want to be holy. See, we believe in holy living. It's possible. But I don't think too many of us ask for it. And that's one thing that separates us from the rest of the churches that are around us is, is we actually believe in this. We, we see this in the Bible. We, we see that we had the possibility to become like Jesus. I don't want to be a religious person and just say, hey, I'm just a really good so-and-so. Yeah, I, I go to that church, so I'm a really good so-and-so. I'm a really good Methodist, a really good Baptist, a really whatever. I'm, you know. We have some things in common with them. Yes, we do. But you know what? I want to become a really good disciple. And I want to know that all the promises of Scripture that have been taught are available, because they are. So I don't want to go in the New Testament and say, well, you know, the disciples lived like that, and that was great, you know. And, and they were really chasing after Jesus, and they were kind of holy, and things were going well. But, but you know what? This is 2022. No, no, I, no. I want everything that God has for me. I want to say, hey. But she's, I don't want to be a better Bob. I want to be a better Jesus, Amen. And we have the opportunity to be better Jesuses in our communities, with our families, to, to love those, to forgive those, to, to share Christ with those around us. You know, we need to get back to talking about holiness a little bit more often because we live in a very unholy world. But it's one of the things that separates us from a lot of other places. A lot of places will call themselves Wesleyan. They'll, they'll say they have that heritage but yet there's a lot of churches that instead of saying yes to Jesus, they've said yes to sin. And, and they're compromising left and right uh, because they want to be more pleasing to the culture than pleasing to the Father. I will never do that. I promise you as your pastor, I'm going to please the Father. <laughs> Which means if I had to say some countercultural tough stuff, I'm going to say it because that's what Jesus would say, amen? And I hope you're with me on that. Membership. We have the right membership in this church. And guess what? It's a saved membership. See, you will never come to church. Some of you are new and you're visiting. And I've had people come to me the last couple of years and say, Pastor Bob, we're mad at you. Why are you mad at me? Because you never invited us to the membership class and I want to be a member. What membership class? <laughs> but it's true. There's churches around here that will teach this nonsense called membership where you bring me your pay stubs. I'm going to tell you how much. That, that might, I, I'm tempted to do that sometimes. I'll be honest with you. Bring your pay stubs, and I'll tell you how much to give. You see? <laughs> and I would never do that because your giving is between you and the Lord. Amen. They're going to make you take a class. Like, here, Alan, brother, you got to take my eight-week class. And at the end of the eight-week class, this little community gets to vote on whether you get to be a member of our church. Some of you have had that experience. You know, you got to take this class and all this stuff. Let me tell you something. That's not what the Bible teaches because you know what membership is? It's your faith in Jesus. So once you become a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, born again, regenerated, you're a member of his church. And we're not a member of New Beginnings or First This or whatever. We're a member of his church. The church of God is laid out in Scripture. I'm not going to toe no denominational line or no class or none of that kind of stuff. I'm a member of God's church because I gave my faith to Jesus, amen? That's who you are this morning. You don't need a stinking membership class or somebody to tell you whether you're good enough to be in church or, or whether you're welcome or, or you got too many tattoos or your dress is too short or, or whatever it is. You're just nonsense. You come to Jesus with what you have, and if you've given your faith to him, you're welcome here, amen? Which means every single person in this community needs to come to saving faith in Jesus and be part of the family. Yeah. And we'll welcome all people. I don't care, Pine Street, I don't, whatever block you live on, you're welcome in this church. Because I want you to hear about Jesus. But you know what? They're not going to hear if we don't tell them. How many of you should run out and say, you know what? I go to this church, this church. And, you know, you can be accepted just by being yourself. 
I'm like, really? You can, you can wear what you want. You can act. You, you just whoever you are, you can be mean as ever. You're, we love you anyways. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, I'm meaner than ever. I've never seen it. I've known a couple of years, four or five years now, I've never seen it, so I don't believe it, but amen. <laughs> it's a steadfast membership. The disciples in Acts chapter 2, man, they were devoted to each other. They were devoted to each other. They spent time together. They loved each other. You know, if, if, I, if I went around this room this morning and asked you how so-and-so sitting next to you was doing spiritually, I bet you half of you couldn't tell me. If I asked, if I asked, if I asked you, the person sitting next to you, how are they doing spiritually? Even Mary people in here probably couldn't tell me. That's not right. <laughs> because if we're doing life together, we should know how we're doing together. Which means I should be able to look back and say, if somebody says, "Hey, how's Tom doing back there spiritually?" Let me tell you about Tom's walk with Jesus. You know, how how's Alan doing spiritually? Let me tell you, he's doing spiritually. You know, across the room, Matt and Angie, how's Matt and Angie doing spiritually? Let's talk about it. Like, we need to get to each other's face because you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to love each other enough to encourage each other. This is the place where you come to find encouragement. This is the place where you find another brother and sister who wants to pray with you. That when you're going through something, I love the fact that we post them all in the family group and so on. But I want to get to a place where we start calling each other. You know, if a prayer request goes up in a family group, maybe, maybe Tara puts up something, she's going through something, then maybe Morgan back there picks up the phone and says, hey, Tara, I just want to pray with you today, sister. Some of you, that's a radical idea, isn't it? Yeah, some of you do it. Call each other. Say, you know, I don't want to just go to church because, because this is not a spectator sport. This isn't going to a sports game. This is being part of the body of Christ, where I'm called to love and to serve and to give, and I'm called to love those around me as Christ loves you, which means I need to wash more feet. You know, the disciples got together and they had meals together. Man, we live in a kind of world where our schedules are so busy that we fail at doing the things that love does. You know, who have you had in the last week? What, what member across the aisle here have you had dinner with? Who have you had lunch with? Who are you taking out for coffee? Who around the church are you allowing to pour into you spiritually? Who are you opening up to? Who are you being honest with? Who are you confessing your sin with? Who's praying for you? <laughs> Listen to this, 1 John 3, 17 and 18. But if anyone has the world's gifts and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and truth. By this they shall know that we are of the truth, and rest assured our hearts are before him. What if we looked at those around us and say, man, you know, a sister, so-and-so, you know, it's like, how many of us have called me Elmo in the last couple of weeks while she's going through what she's going through? You know, I'm not talking about just reaching out on Facebook because I think that's the easy thing to do. I think it's something else to say, man, let me, let me pick up the phone call. You know, let, let me go run by somebody's house, man. I know they had surgery this week, so let me drop off a care package. So what I'm saying this morning is our love needs to leave these four walls, and we need to start loving in real tangible ways. And we meet each other's needs. I asked myself this morning, who in the church is my friend? Friendship should be a high priority in the church. Who's my friend? Who am I open up to? You know, the church has the right methodology. We worship together. Worship is so important. Remember it says this, and so this day by day, they attended the temple together and break and bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They, they did life together. It wasn't just, hey, let me go to church because I, I just want to check that off my weekly checklist as if somehow God is going to be pleased if I just went to church. No, it doesn't work that way because that's not his plan. I say, man, let me get involved. <laughs> let me get involved. Let me not only get involved in the, in the lives of the people in the church, but what about the people around me in the world? What if we looked at our jobs and, our, and the places we work and said, you know what? I am a missionary on mission for Jesus. So whether I work in a big office or little office or fast food restaurant or whatever it is, those people around me, those are the harvests that the Lord has laid before me. Those are the people that I should be praying with, inviting to church and telling about Jesus. Yeah, most of us, we see this and we're like, 
I'm going to say, who in the last week have you told about Jesus? I'm not talking about somebody in your household or your family, but you all have probably passed somebody this week. Did you tell anybody about him? Did you tell anybody, I know where love is? I know where you can be forgiven? I know where you matter? I have a family for your family? Most of us, we're going through life, we're so busy that we're not having those conversations. Yet the disciples, the Lord added to their number daily because they went, they did more. See, I want us as a church to love each other so much that not only do we come in here to worship together, because you guys worship together, great, man. I love church. I love New I mean, Sunday is my favorite day of the week. Wednesday is my second favorite day of the week. I love hanging out with all you guys. You guys, you guys I love serving with you guys. I, just, I love all of it. There are some things that we do really well here. And being in a church together is one of those things we do really well. I'm so proud of you guys. You guys are such a loving, awesome family. But I think we can love greater. I think that's our next step as a church, to love greater. Because here's the deal. Every healthy church, big, little, whatever it is, if it's a healthy church, has small groups. We're calling them home groups because I believe that's a nice biblical term. And what a home group is is that you open up your home so not only other Christians once in a while, you have them over for a meal, you do a little devotional together. I'm not asking you to do day by day, although I might. And what I'm saying is what we need in this community more than anything is block by block we're opening up our homes. And we're saying once a month we're going to have a meal together with other Christians and we're going to invite our neighbors. And we're going to share Christ together. And we're going to look for needs to meet. See, I asked you in the church this morning, how's the person next to you doing spiritually? I think the question Jesus would ask you is, how's your neighbor doing spiritually? How's the person who lives right next door to you, where are they at? And they're walking Jesus. That's something, I, I, I wrestle with that every single day. Since I moved here, I asked the question all the time, how are my neighbors doing spiritually? Now, I could tell you this morning, I, I go house by house, have them in church, <laughs> to say, I know how they're doing spiritually. But if you ask the question, when you look around the world you live in and look at your neighbors and your coworkers and say, man, how are they doing spiritually? What if you had a place to invite them to? Who in this room is going to love enough to say, I'm going to open up my home once a month. I'm going to host a home group. I want one here on Poplar Street. We have that already. I talked to Ellen Katie the other day about hosting one on the other side of CVS. Why? Because we're not reaching anybody over there yet. So what if we go by Alan and Katie's house and once a month we host a meal? Rami and I are going to help with that. We're going to do a devotional. I'm going to start posting three questions out of every sermon online so you could print out the sermon notes. And when you're in a small group, you just say, hey, Bob said we should meet together every day. What do you think about that? Have a discussion. And we're, we're going to meet in these different. We need to do this because we want to reach people over there by CVS, the other side. Sycamore Street and Chestnut Street and Oak and Pine. And, and what if each of us just said, you know what? I can open up my house once a month to host a little meal and host a little Bible study so that we can reach the people we live in. Now, those who live outside the city, you still got to be a major support of that because we need to fill those up. We need to be prayer partners. But I'm thinking this morning, what about Ashland? We now have four families living in Ashland. What if we start an Ashton small group? You know, would, 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 would you guys who live in Ashton open up your home? What about Ohio? What if we found a way to bridge the gap between Terrace House and Caitlin's House and put a small group in the middle there in Ohio and start reaching people who live out in the country? We could do it. What if we went to Debbie and Ryan? The love is, you know, we're going to start one over there. We don't know anybody over there yet, but we're going to start reaching people over there. What about Ralph 75 in Spring Valley? Andrew, and I think you guys live out that way, right? We start one out that way by the airport or by Spring Valley. See, we, we have to. What about Brooke and Chris? We're going to go out there and say, we're going to go pass Hibley hot dogs. We're going to stop there and pick up some hot dogs. And... <laughs> I would. I would not take Hibley hot dogs over anything Chris. Chris, I just, Chris can cook, y'all. <laughs> he gets those pictures going on Facebook, and I'm like, I'm so hungry, and I just had a full meal, but I don't care. That pasta, whatever it is, I'm just... I'm a fan. One day I believe Chris is going to open up his own place. I'll be the first one in line. I hope they have their first $10 bill hanging on the wall there. First $10 he made, he sold Pastor Bob one of those whoppy cuppies or <laughs> <laughs> whoppy cupcakes. Not cuppy. <laughs> Although that'd be a cool. <laughs> hey guys, I know that there's been some. <laughs> That's got to be the name now, cuppies, whoppy cuppies. <laughs> Anyways, listen to this. 
44 and 45, and all who believed were together. Do we have any believers in the church this morning? They were together, and they had things in common. Oh, they had things in common. It's a miracle. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds of all who had need. How many willing to do that this morning? You know, I'm going to go sell some of my stuff in my house because my sister and brother over here need some food. I'm going to sell some of my belongings. You know, we, we could get there. But see, they talked together. They broke bread together. They shared a meal together. And you know what? They witnessed together. They witnessed together. They actually shared their faith. They actually were opened up to other people. And what did the Lord do? As the disciples were living it out, the Lord added to their number daily. Which means, get this, if we choose to love each other in this manner and just do what they did, what could the Lord do here in New Beginnings? If we open up some small groups this summer, my plan is to have four running by this fall. One here on Poplar Street, running one on the other side of CVS, I need two more. And we're not going to split those groups up by age or anything like that. It's open for anybody. I just need some missionaries willing to open up their house so we can reach your neighbors. And eventually, I want to go beyond those borders next year. I'd like to be in Ashland. I'd like to be further out. Because New Beginnings just isn't about CK here. It's not like God just calls us to reach CK. God's called us to reach to the ends of the earth. And maybe we need to go to the end of the earth over there in Ohio. It's far away. Amen. <laughs> but can we do it? I want to, I'm going to, over the next three weeks, I'm going to lay out this vision of what I think it's going to take to grow the church. And here's the deal. We will not grow this church at all until we get in our community. We can, this is the problem with church nowadays is churches, and, and, I, and I've been guilty of this too, is we get on our calendar and we fill our calendar with event after event after event after event, and we think people are just going to come. Guess what? We are past the day and age where people are going to just come to church. It don't happen no more. We're more in a first century kind of world where they don't have a reason to, and we need to take the reason out. So if we want a healthy, thriving, healthy, thriving church, we need, to, we need to use our mouths and our witness. We need to go out there and we need to tell the lost people where to be found. If we're not willing to do that, then we're not even, we shouldn't even call ourselves a church. Now we're just, we're just a group of people that hang out together. But if we're willing to love like Jesus, we could do amazingly more. I heard, everybody comes to me like, I just wish our church was bigger. Who would you bring with you? I wish the church was bigger. I wish the kids ministry had this. Are you serving kids ministry? I wish the worship team had a piano player. You bring me a piano player? <laughs> Everybody has needs and wishes, and I get that. And there's a lot of things I wish for, too. But they got to be reached. And here's the deal. Listen to this, X18. But if you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. How many people in this room have been baptized? You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And we can pray for more of it if you need it. But you have enough power inside of you that you're supposed to be, and I would underline this in my Bible, you will be my what? What does it say? You're my witnesses. New Beginnings Church of God, you are Jesus Christ's witnesses into our community. It's your job. It's actually, I would say, even go further to say this, it's an obedience thing. You know what? My heart breaks, and I think this breaks Jesus' heart more than anything, is when we have people who call themselves Christians who have never led anybody else to Christ. And there's people who call themselves Christians who have never led anybody else to Christ, who would say they're good, strong Christians. They go to church every week. They tithe. They're faithful. They're, they do all this stuff. They're good, strong Christians. Yet you might consider yourself a good, strong Christian, but you're failing at the very thing that Jesus had to do. You failed at the very thing he said to do, to be a witness, to go make disciples. The first and the last thing he told his disciples, go make disciples. And we look at this all the time, we're like, man, you know, I'm really strong in my church, and I serve in my church, and this and that. And, and I hear down the block, this church down here likes to tell our people, oh, we had 143 on this Sunday. I don't care how many people you had in your church. I want to hear, I want to hear how many disciples are being made. I want to hear how many lives are transforming. Who's changing? Who's growing? Who's going from angry racist to teaching little kids? Who's going from addiction to freedom? Who's seeing their family members get saved? Who's willing to go out and tell people that there's a Jesus, he's alive and he's a living and we know where to find him? 
I would rather have a small, tiny, weeny little church if there's a dozen people who are sold out for Jesus than to have 200 people that are just religious. I would rather have a dozen little people that are out there sharing their faith and, and doing what Jesus said versus to say, I go to church every week, but I'm not, I'm just religious. We don't have a religious faith, my brothers and sisters. We got a living and active faith. Which means that if you haven't led somebody to Christ at this point in your life, you need to do some soul search and say, why not? Because if this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do in me, and this is what Jesus wants me to do, then maybe I should do it. And maybe I should look at the people around me as my mission field and say, you know what? There's somebody I can lead to Christ. And I want to do it. Because here's the everybody talks about growing. Oh, I just want to grow as a Christian. You know, it really drives me nuts when somebody tells me I'm becoming the church, but I'm not growing as a Christian. Okay, I, I get that. You got preferences. You will never grow as a Christian if you're not sharing your faith. Because it's, that's the vehicle God has given us to grow our faith. It's when you're pouring out that he pours in. It's when, you, it's when you're confronted with somebody who asks you a question and you don't have the answer that you go home and rip the pages of your Bible open and say, I need that answer. You want to grow in your faith? Go share your faith. Go have a non-Christian ask you questions about Jesus. And then you're going to be like, whoa, 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 I need to go read my Bible. You want to grow in your faith? Serve, love, give. Do what Jesus did. Don't be like, I'm going to church, man, and, and that message this morning just didn't speak to me. Well, maybe it didn't. I'd rather hear about your discipleship. What if it was Sunday morning in this church and we got together? And next time I said, is there any praise reports in the church? Get this. This is my vision. I say, is there any praise reports in the church? And five of you stand up and say, I told somebody about Jesus this week. Hey, Pastor Bob, I prayed with my coworker. They were struggling and I got to pray with them. I knew this lost person this week, man. I told them to come to church and where Jesus was at. You know what, this week, man, I prayed with my kids every single day. This week, I got in the Bible. You know, my next-door neighbor who I've been living next to for year after year, I finally told them that i go to a church and ask them what they'd come with, only to find out they don't know Jesus. What if when I said, is there any testimonies in the church, we had more people stand up and say, let me tell you how I lived it this week. Let me tell you how I lived it this week. I wasn't a religious Christian just going to church. This week, man, I loved my neighbor. You know, I saw my neighbor across the street. And, and, you know, the kids looked like they needed some shoes. I went and bought them a pair of shoes. There's a family on block that needs school supplies. You know what? I got a little extra cash this week. Oh, you know, I went and bought them some school supplies. What if we came in here and every Sunday we had to celebrate the things that God was doing in our lives because we went out and actually lived for Jesus? There's quite a difference between a religious person and a, and a disciple. And it's because we have the right master. Who's the master of my heart? He's powerful. He's wonderful. He's incredible. He's personal. He's with me. He's for me. His name is Jesus. And I have to make the decision, am I for him or for myself? Because this is the kind of faith that we don't want. This is the kind of faith that won't grow the church. It's a faith that's for ourselves. We're just enjoying things the way they are, and it's good enough. No, I want to grow the kind of church where you're so fired up for Jesus that we're celebrating what you, how you're living for him. We're celebrating the fact that you're praying for people and leading people. We're celebrating the fact that you're opening your homes to your neighbors and people are coming to Christ and things are changing. I want to celebrate the fact that the small group idea I have, which I believe has come from God, that in the next year or so, we have five or six of them operating in this community in different blocks. And we start answering the question, how's my neighbor doing? You know, are we good Samaritans? Or are we just the people walking by? If you know the good Samaritan story, he stopped. Are we good Samaritans or are we just people walking by? I'm going to ask you a serious question this morning. Are you a disciple of Jesus or are you just a religious person coming to church? You can answer that question by looking at you last week. How'd you live for Jesus? Are you a good so-and-so because you, you grew up that way? I hear all the time, well, I, it's just the way I grew up. Guess what? The way you grew up might be wrong. <laughs> 
Because if the way you grew up isn't biblical and it doesn't lead you to Jesus, it don't matter how you grew up. Because you just stand before God, God's going to say, so? <laughs> are you a Christian this morning because your family's a Christian or because you're serious about Jesus? Are you in church because you're going to church because somebody else is going to church or you're going to church this morning because you're serious about Jesus? Because if we're serious about Jesus, we're going to live for Jesus. And when we get serious about Jesus, the Lord will add to our number daily. And the reason he's not adding to our number daily is because we got some questions to ask ourselves. We've gotten really good at doing church, but what about being the church? The pantry can't be all that we do. That's just a start. It's always meant to be a start. There's more ways for us to love our neighbors. There's, some of you have a vision. You have gifts from the Holy Spirit. We need those. So this morning, are you a religious person or are you a disciple? If you've been doing the religious thing, which I believe some of us have, Maybe you need that second work we talked about on Wednesday. Maybe it's time you go to the altar this morning and say, you know what, Jesus? I want to be all in. I don't want to die tomorrow and say, I didn't do what you said to do. But I want to do what you said to do, so when I get to heaven, I'm going to celebrate. I don't want to get to heaven and have a conversation with Jesus. Says, Jesus, let's, let's talk about the Great Commission. You're like, I didn't have time. I want to get to heaven. And he says, man, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on in. There's a banquet for you. I've prepared a place for you. Let's go. Are you religious or are you a disciple? Because if we make the decision to be disciples, we're going to grow this church exponentially the next couple of years. And it's going to happen through small groups. Michael, tell you, you took that training with me at camp, right? My, I was telling him this morning that you're like, well, there is a roadmap. Like Bob's actually, <laughs> you have to ask him about it. It's a great story. But small groups are a step that we're going to take. And if we do them right, we're going to grow this church exponentially. But you have to decide to be a disciple. Because if you're a disciple, then you're a missionary. And if you're a missionary, then you're a missionary to our neighbors. No matter where you live. If you're willing to drive from Ohio, someone else will drive from Ohio. If you're willing to drive from Lafayette, someone else will drive from Lafayette. If you're willing to drive from, from 75, someone else will drive out that way. I believe it. Do you? Where's your team head back up this morning? I asked that question of those watching online this morning, too. Are you just a religious person watching our service because you're in your jammies and it's comfortable? Or are you willing to get uncomfortable and be a disciple of Jesus? Are you willing to get uncomfortable and actually come into the church, be part of what God is doing here? Are, are you willing to do what needs to be done because it's what Jesus has? Because if we're just going to be religious people, that's enough of those churches around us, Amen. We don't want to be that way. What I want, what I hope you want, is we want to be the church of the living God. That's doctrinally sound, methodology sound, worship, whole nine yards. This morning, I'm going to open up the altar because we're going to sing this new song. And I, I really stressed out the worship team this week because I said, there's a song I really want to sing. That's for a reason. You don't know it, but you're going to have to learn it real quick. And so they did. But it says, I want more of you. I want more of you. It means I want to look into my heart this morning and say, maybe I've settled in some areas. But you know what? I want more of you, Jesus. Jesus, I want, I want more of you. It says, it says to search my heart and I'll give you my heart. It's like, Jesus, I don't want to just give you the little left side of my heart here. This is my little religious side of my heart. But I want to say, I want you to have all of it. Jesus, I want to fall so in love with you that I'm going to love others the way you love them. Jesus, I want to fall so in love with you that I want to share my faith with people because that's what you did. You came all the way down from heaven to walk on this earth to give us a chance of salvation, and you want to use me to tell somebody? Who am I telling? I want to fall so in love with Jesus that when I'm in the grocery store, the gas station, I'm burning to tell somebody about him. I want us as a church to fall so in love with Jesus that it's so normal to walk this community and somebody for new beginnings. We're going to be known as that crazy church. You know that church, New Beginnings? They keep inviting me. Yeah, we want you to know Jesus. When was the last time you were in a grocery store and somebody invited you to church? You ever wonder why there's millions and billions of Christians and nobody's sharing their faith? Yet they all claim to follow Jesus. What if it became normal? What if at your job you were known as that crazy Christian? 
You're, the, you're known as that crazy Christian, that, the, that bank lady, she's a little crazy. Why? Because she's telling me about Jesus. She said, my Jesus, there's a way. I want you to get serious this morning. It's time to search your hearts and say, I want more Jesus. If you need that, the altars are open this morning. I'd love to pray with you.